you know, our faith is something that's very personal to us, and it's also something that's very inward. We can say we have a certain amount of faith or, or pretend or come across like we have a certain amount of faith, but how much faith do we really have? I think in all honesty, most of us, our faith is probably here, and we'd love to have it up here you know, or up here, but how do we do that? Well, over 10 years ago, I had something happen to me that changed my life, and I'd like to share it with you today. Hey, I'm Mitch, and our ministry is called Keeping the Vows, and I'll be your host today. I've been a pastor for over 30 years and marriage counselor, uh, and also uh, been married to Kim for over 37 years. So I'd like to bring all that into what we teach. Uh, over 10 years ago, I was doing my devotions one day, and one of the things about being a Christian is we need to be in God's Word. There's no substitute for being in God's Word. God's Word is incredibly powerful and can change our lives. So I was reading in Luke chapter 10, and I'd like to just read some of the things that I learned um, in there. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent his 72 disciples out. And so I'd like to teach you something here that you can learn about Christ. You know, we, we want to know more about God. Well, if we want to know about him, let's just read his word because Jesus is God in the flesh. He's God incarnate. So it's interesting to see how he planned and how he thought things out. And just listen and learn, glean what we can from him. First of all, Jesus sent out 72 people, but he sent them out by twos. So that meant he sent out 36 groups of people. And he gave them some very specific instructions. And by the way, this is Luke 10, verses 1 through 20. First of all, they weren't, they weren't to take along any provisions of their own. And I, after I say each one of these, I'm going to kind of say maybe a commentary of maybe why. Well, maybe this would emphasize their dependence on God if they weren't supposed to take along anything else. They were not to talk to anyone else along the way. Interesting. This would set them up for the, the litmus test that was coming up next. It's interesting why they wouldn't talk to anyone else along the way, but hey, God knows. Next, they were going to, when they went into a town, um, and whichever house they would enter, they were to say, peace to this house. So they were given instructions by God what to say. Then they were instructed that if the man returned their peace, they were to stay at that house and not move around from house to house in the city. Again, another interesting thing. And in the house of peace, they were to eat whatever they were given. So in other words, the rules didn't necessarily you know, apply. Just whatever they were given, they were supposed to eat. Interesting you said that. They were also supposed to heal the sick. And they were supposed to tell the people, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Well, Jesus instructed them that when you enter a town where you're not welcome, go into the streets and actually say these words. Even the dust from your own town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. And then Jesus gives them more encouragement about the importance of their mission and closes with this. He says, whoever listens to you listens to me and whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. So this sets the stage for the devotions of mine on that day. And verse uh, uh, 17 is where all this begins to reveal itself. You see, Jesus told them to go out and do all this, and they came back to Jesus. And when they came back, they said these words. They said, we rejoice that even the spirits obeyed us. Now, I wasn't brought up in a church. I wasn't brought up as a Christian, really, so I don't understand some of the terminology of church. So rejoice isn't a word that I was really understood or comfortable with. Rejoice isn't a word I would use every day. I don't say, oh, I rejoice. It's a beautiful day. I say, oh, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? Okay. So I thought to myself, okay, what would happen? Jesus said, you know, rejoice. And what would happen if I could rejoice every day? What would happen if I could rejoice that God was in me every day? I know that I'm a sinner. I've made a decision to follow Christ. I've asked him to forgive my sins. I've asked him to help me live my life for him. So what would happen if I could rejoice that my name was written in heaven every day? How would my life be different if I could keep that at the forefront of my mind? And so I thought about it and I thought, well, how do I make it personal for me? Well, for me, I couldn't use the word rejoice because I don't really relate to that word very well because I wasn't brought up with it and it never clicked with me like that. So I thought, well, what other words work? Well, I, I spent some time thinking about it and looking up words and things like that. And what, what occurred to me was, today, I think Jesus would say, Mitch, be amazed. Your name is written in heaven. Be amazed. Your name is written in heaven. And I really think, for me, that's what rejoicing means, is being amazed that my name is written in heaven. So I thought to myself, what would happen every single day if I could wake up and be amazed that my name is written in heaven? You know, it would make me incredibly grateful. And gratitude makes what we have enough. I want to say it again. Gratitude makes what we have enough. If you're thankful for what you have, you don't, you're not out wanting for more. 
So what if every day I could be amazed that my name is written in heaven? And so what I did was I put some things in place. So we have a company, and our, the name of the company is Be Amazed, Inc. Um, my email has Be Amazed in my personal email. So every single day, every time I use my email, it's just a reminder for me to be amazed that my name is written in heaven. And it's changed my life. Every single day, I, I have a filter that I run things through. And I get up and I say, okay, I'm going to be amazed that my name is written in heaven. I wake up and I say, hey, God, I've been sleeping, but you haven't. I know you're working somewhere. I want to be a part of that today. I'm amazed my name is written in heaven. And my gratitude has made that enough for me. That's my portion. And so now I'm going to live out my life in thanks to you because my name is written in heaven. And I rejoice in that. So it changes my whole outlook of everything. I don't uh, you know, it's times for counseling. People come into my office and they'd say, well, this happened in my life or I have cancer or this happened. And they were down on God and blaming God for it. Well, I've had cancer. I'm a survivor. But when I got cancer, what I said instead was, how can this bring glory to Jesus? I mean, I'm human. I thought, well, I don't really care to leave my wife and kids and grandkids behind. You know, that went through my mind because I'm, I am human. But what it really came down to was, how can this bring glory to Jesus? A friend of mine had lunch, and he said, what can my wife and I do for you guys, you know, that I had cancer? And I said, really nothing. I don't have to, I don't have to make a deal with God. I don't have to get closer to God. I don't have to reconsider my faith. I'm where I need to be. I, I feel I'm, I'm solid on that. I'm still amazed my name is written in heaven. And somehow this is going to bring glory to Jesus. Well, of course it did. You know, I was, I was laying in an MRI table, whatever, CAT scan, whatever it was, laying a couple of those things. I was laying in that and the nurse got talking and I got talking about my wife and how I love her. And she started talking about how her marriage wasn't that good. Well, it was my opportunity to tell her what Jesus Christ had done for me. And every, every step along the way, it was my opportunity to just witness to other people and be Jesus to them. So that's what my life is like now. So I, what I have is enough because I'm grateful for it. And I will never, ever repay this debt that Jesus paid for my sins. I will forever, as long as I live, as long as I have a breath, you know, I, I, I have a reason. As long as I have a pulse, I have a purpose. And my purpose is to bring glory to Jesus Christ because of what he's done in my life. And that's taken my faith from here and brought it up to here is what it's done. Totally changed my life. Changed the way I look at, at me. I see myself as a precious child of God. Changed the way I look at my wife. She's a precious child of God. And my job is to, to cre treat her with the type of respect and honor that God would have me to because she's God's child. And everything I do gets run through that filter. So the first filter is hey, I'm amazed my name is written in heaven. And the second filter every day is, how can this bring glory to Jesus? Whatever thing happens in my life, how can it bring glory to Jesus? I hope you like uh, the lesson today, what you learned. If you do, I'd appreciate it if you, uh, if you subscribe, like this video, subscribe. Go to our webpage uh, called keepingthevows.com. And um, also we've got a book coming out soon. So uh, keep in touch there on the blog. We'll let you know when that comes out and that's available. And... Uh, Thank you so much for um, just tuning in and listening. I appreciate it. Remember, gratitude makes what you have enough. Be amazed that your name is written in heaven. Have a good day.